Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will be beginning now. Good afternoon, Professor Jai Kuma, Chair of the CIL International Advisory Panel, Professor Tommy Ko, Chair of CIL's Governing Board, CIL Director, Dr. Nilifo Oral, Your Excellencies, distinguished speakers and guests, both in person and virtually. On behalf of the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore, I am delighted to welcome you to the CIL conference on the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, an assessment. My name is Tara Davenport, and I will be your MC for the next two days, along with my colleague from CIL, Ms. Maria Pierre Benosa. After two years of virtual meeting in the pandemic world, we are so happy to be able to welcome speakers and guests in person while still having the wide audience that Zoom is able to reach. This is one of our first attempts at holding a hybrid conference, so please do bear with us in the event we have any technical hiccups, which is guaranteed. Um, without further ado, I am delighted to invite Professor Tommy Koh, Chairman of the CIL Governing Board, to the stage to give his opening remarks. Uh, of course, Prof. Koh needs no introduction. Having a varied and multifaceted career as a scholar and diplomat, leading several critical international negotiations, and of course, most importantly for present purposes, Prof. Koh served as president of the third UN Conference on the Law of the Sea. Everyone, Prof. Koh. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Tara. Your Excellency, judges, colleagues and friends. We meet at a critical moment in the history of the world. The question before us is, what kind of a world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world governed by might is right and where disputes between states are settled by war. I call this Putin's world. Or do we want to live in a world governed by law and where disputes between states are settled peacefully? I think I can speak for all of us here and online when I say that we do not want to live in Putin's world. On the 24th of February, 2022, Russia launched an unprovoked attack against its neighbour, Ukraine. Although outgunned and outnumbered, the brave people and leaders of Ukraine have put, out, put up a strong resistance. They have refused to surrender. I request Ambassador Katerina Zelenko to stand. Please, please stand. Let's give her a round of applause. <clears throat> I want Ambassador Zelenko to know that Ukraine has our strong support. <clears throat> Forty years ago, when Professor Jayakumar and I were young men, on the 30th of April, 1982, after nine years of arduous negotiations, the third UN Conference on the Law of the Sea adopted <clears throat> the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS by a vote of 130 in favour, four again, with 17 exemptions. On the 10th of December of the same year, the convention was signed by 119 states in Montego Bay, Jamaica. The convention came into force in 1994, <clears throat> and today it has 168 parties, including the European Union. We meet to celebrate the 40th anniversary of UNCLOS. We, we do so for several reasons. First, the Convention had put an end to a period of chaos 
and unilateralism in the law of the sea. In its place, we have a treaty which I once described as a constitution for the world's oceans. <clears throat> Second, the convention treats the oceans as an ecological unity and seeks to protect them from warming, acidification, and pollution. Third, the convention has kept the peace at sea. Fourth, the convention's system of mandatory dispute settlement has not guaranteed but enhanced the prospects that disputes between states on the interpretation and application of the convention would be settled by peaceful means. Fifth, the convention is a revolutionary treaty and includes many new concepts of law. The convention seeks to accommodate the interests of all countries, but especially of the developing countries. The argument that the convention is a product of the West therefore had no merit. And six, the convention is part of our rule-based international order, which is under threat. <clears throat> this is not, however, an ordinary birthday party. Over the next two days, we will review objectively the effectiveness of the three institutions the convention is given birth to, namely the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the International Seabed Authority, and a commission on the limits of the continental shelf. We want to see whether UNCLOS has been able to accommodate new developments and respond to new challenges. We want to evaluate the system of mandatory dispute settlement. We want to discuss the relationship between UNCLOS and other legal regimes. We want to examine the relationship between UNCLOS and this region, Southeast Asia. And finally, we will, in panel seven, attempt to take stock of the success and failures of UNCLOS over the past 40 years. I shall conclude by thanking all of you, both here and online, for joining us on this, I hope, joyful intellectual journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Ko, uh, for those insightful, inspiring, and timely remarks. It gives me great pleasure now to invite CIL Director Dr. Nila Forel to stage to give her welcome remarks. She also needs no introduction and is a renowned expert in law of the sea, international environmental law, and climate change law, and is also a member of the International Law Commission. Thank you, dear Tara. Excellencies, judges, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, um, as director of the Center for International Law, it is truly an honor to welcome all of you to this hybrid experimental, shall we say, conference celebrating 40th anniversary of the United Nations Convention for the Law of the Sea. And may I say it is truly a thrill to be able to be at this podium and actually giving a welcome speech to an audience where we're all in the same room. So this is something really that uh, has taken on a whole new meaning for us. But I also warmly welcome the very many who are joining us from around the world through the miracle of technology. So welcome to all of you. Well, many years ago when I embarked upon my journey uh, as a Law of the Sea Scholar and for international law, I could not have imagined celebrating the 40th anniversary together with none other than um, the president of the third conference of the Law of the Sea, the person who famously described the convention as the constitution for the ocean, 
and the person who skillfully brought the nine year long negotiations for the convention to a successful end. And currently my dear mentor, friend, and chairperson of the CIL board, Tommy Coe. So what an honor it is for me. I also could not have imagined sharing this day with so many other luminaries of the law of the sea and who have joined us in Singapore. And I welcome my dear friends uh, who have come here actually, and the many who will join us virtually. So on behalf of the Center for International Law, I extend my deepest gratitude to all of you for accepting our invitation. Now, Professor Koh has highlighted some six key reasons we celebrate the Law of the Sea Convention 40 years on. And if I may add some additional thoughts as well. UNCLOS is truly a remarkable achievement for many reasons, which in my view have become even more pertinent um, today as we look back. There is no other multilateral treaty with its breadth, scope, and daring. 320 articles were adopted covering so many different activities and interests, and today I am not sure we would have such a convention. It did not simply codify customary international law, but it created a new set of rules and regimes to ensure the peaceful uses of the ocean and seas. This included part 12 on the protection and preservation of the marine environment, which in my opinion today, 40 years later, remains unrivaled in the clarity of its obligations and scope of application. While it did not foresee all threats, such as climate change, this does not mean that the convention does not provide the tools we need to address them. Part 15 on dispute settlement itself was an Olympian undertaking to provide a strong foundation for peaceful settlement of disputes within a rules-based order. As we watch the brutal invasion by Russia of Ukraine, we can only better appreciate the fragility of peace and the need for a strong rules-based order, which is one of the core functions of the Law of the Sea Convention. It sought to provide this in its ambition to create a legal order for the seas and oceans that will promote the peaceful uses of the seas and its natural resources. So in the next two days together, we will engage in an assessment of the Law of the Sea Convention in the past 40 years with seven panels, some 35 panelists. And yet we know this topic is so vast uh, we will but scratch the surface in the limited time we have. Lastly, I have to thank our fantastic team at the Center for International Law. I am truly blessed to be the director of this center uh, with such um, truly committed and, uh, and um, dedicated staff. Special thanks to Tara Davenport, who you've met. Pia Benoza, and of course, our great events team, Jerry Ng and Matthew Yao, and everyone else who's been helping us. So uh, I thank you. I hope we have a wonderful two days together, a day and a half together, you know, discussing in detail um, the convention. Thank you so much.